Satoma Satkamaya Tamasoma Jyotirkamaya Mrityorma Amritam Kamaya Aviravir Mahethi Rutrayate Dakshinam Mukham Tenamam Pahidityam May the Divine lead us from the unreal to the real, from darkness to light, from death to immortality. May the Divine Consciousness fill our hearts and protect us. <coughs> our subject today is overcoming fear. There is fear inside all of us. Fear is one thing that is we could say is universal. It's somehow inbuilt into our system. It's not just human beings, it's every living being that is fear in the heart. We may never have really made a list of the things that we're afraid of, but sometimes it's, it may be a good exercise when you have some free time and nothing else to do, to just sit quietly and every one of us can ask ourselves, what are the things I'm really afraid of in life? Surely there is fear, but what, what exactly I'm fearful about? And we will discover that uh, there, could, there are really different kinds of fear at every level, physical, emotional, moral, intellectual. Every time we feel a threat at any of these levels, uh, a fear seizes the heart. There's an ancient verse in a book called uh, Vairagya Shatakam, a hundred verses on, on detachment by Bhartrahari. There is this beautiful verse uh, in which it encapsulates how everything in life is filled with fear. So I'll read that verse to you in Sanskrit and then the translation. So the Sanskrit verse goes like this. Bhoge roga bhayam kule chuti bhayam vitten rupalat bhayam mane dainya bhayam bale ripu bhayam rupe jaraya bhayam shastre vadi bhayam gunai khala bhayam Kaye Kritantat Bhayam Sarvam Vastu Bhayan Vitam Bhubindrinam Vairagya Meva Bhayam So Bhayam is fear in Sanskrit. So the meaning of this verse is In enjoyment there is the fear of disease. In social position the fear of falling off. In wealth the fear of hostile kings or, or thieves today. In honor, the fear of humiliation. In power, the fear of enemies. In beauty, the fear of old age. In scholarship, the fear of opponents. In virtue, the fear of slanderers. In body, the fear of death. All the things in the world are associated with fear. Detachment alone leads to fearlessness. But that's the theme of the book. And so what it tries to show is that if it is true that detachment alone leads to fearlessness, then it stands to reason that it's our attachments, our clinging to things, to people, to objects, to places, that is the source of all, all problem. Because the moment I cling to something and I feel that If that thing or whatever that entity, that is, again, it could be place, person, things, even ideas, if I'm separated from them, then, um, then somehow um, I feel threatened. I feel my own existence is, is threatened in some way. And that's the source of all fear. Now, when the object of fear is not very clear or it's ambiguous, it's then it produces anxiety. Anxiety is a kind of fear, but with no clear object. It's kind of more diffused. The Panchadashi, there's another Vedanta text, I think probably around 14th century, uh, it compares anxiety to a kind of poison. 
because just as a poison can eat away our vitals and even threaten our being, anxiety is what eats away, drains away all our energy and joy in life. So since fear is so universal, although we all may not have the same kind of fear, but in one form or other, in one kind or the other, fear in some way is in the hearts of us all. According to the Upanishads, the primary cause of fear is, is, is uh, separation. The moment, the Upanishad says, the moment we separate ourselves from the rest of the universe, uh, fear comes. There's one time in the course of a 24-hour cycle, in the course of a day, that all of us become fearless. And that is in a state of deep sleep. In a state of deep sleep, um, nobody ex experiences that. There could be fear if there are nightmares in a dream. Dream could be fearful also. But in deep sleep, we are not separated from anyone. Everything is just kind of oneness. And so, at least from that direct experience that we have, we know that when things are separated, Potentially, I'm not saying there has to be fear, but potentially there is fear. Now that separation we can see also sometimes um, just, just at the moment of birth. Every baby, immediately after birth, the first thing the baby does is it cries. And there could be many explanations about why the baby cries. But Sometimes that example is given in books to show that as long as the baby was with the mother, uh, there wasn't any cry. The moment, the first moment when the baby gets separated from the mother after birth, uh, life begins with, with crying. Separation, all of the creation myths, in some way, in different traditions, are also separation myths. Because, again, just as a baby gets separated from the mother when God created us. Again, we might have different versions of how God did it, but the act of creation is also an act of separation. That after creation, we are no longer with a part of God. And then it gets further mythologized when you see, for instance, the, the story of the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve were expelled. Now that was a separation, and that we know how that separation um, created this whole existential experience of humanity. So in one form or other, um, all separations um, lead to, to fear, anxiety, and suffering in general. Now, one way in our lives we try to overcome fear is, one way is to just if we know the object of fear, that I'm afraid of this, one way we try to do is try to stay away from that object of fear. Uh, it's not always possible to do so. Well, if the object of fear is a material, if it's a person or a place, I could say I'm going to stay away from that place or that person. But if the object of fear is some kind of a idea or some, something more intangible, then it's not so easy to escape it. If that idea of fear is lodged in my head, then uh, no matter where I go, where will I hide from it? We also try to overcome fear sometimes by just expanding ourselves. By expanding, I mean all the relationships that we develop in life or being a part of a larger group, the network, the family, the friends, being a part of a, a large country, being a citizen of a country. So we then become a part of a larger whole and are able to deal with causes which seem more powerful than just one individual. So when I become, when I have a, a support group, some, some larger entity from which I can derive security, then, then I feel I become a little stronger. So if there is a problem, it's not just me against the world. My family will stand by me. My friends will stand by me. So that way, 
That's another way we try to face the constant threat that occurs in our lives. But we know that while these things might work sometimes and to some extent, uh, we are never really without fear at all times. There's, there's always there's something for which we will always be afraid. None of these other methods might work. So I think we need to look a little bit more deeper into seeing what exactly is the cause of this. Because if we go to the root cause, and if we can remove that cause, then it might be easier to deal with it. These kind of quick fixes, the stopgap arrangements may not, may not always be helpful. So one of the things that we see is that there are two basic processes which give life its both dynamism and diversity. There are two things happening in life. First thing is the process of impermanence, that everything in life is impermanent. Nothing lasts. Sometimes it's difficult to accept this when we are very young. But as we grow older, uh, and especially when we begin to see in terms of people, people whom we have known, maybe the elders in our family, when they pass away, when some of the possessions we had, those go away, in one form or the other, we begin to see that things don't last. Living or non-living, things keep on changing. Impermanence is the is a reality of our lives. Um, alongside this process of constant destruction of thing, oftentimes the destruction is very slow, so we don't immediately see it go. It's kind of a gradual. That's why they say, um, although we tend to treat death as an event, as something that happens, but death itself can be seen as a process that we start dying from the moment we are born. And what we call death is only the completion of that process. But because it's a slow deterioration, a slow destruction of the body spread over decades, we're not able to see that change. So that's another way to see it, that things are constantly going away. And because of that, the second important process in life is the struggle, is the struggle for existence. Because impermanence threatens our existence. Impermanence means a thing is here now, it's not going to be here after a few days or years. And that threat, we try to overcome that threat with the struggle for existence. So these are the, the two basic realities of life, impermanence and a struggle to exist. Um, philosophically, these two terms are called um, non-being. So impermanence means non-being. Things are and things no longer are. So being, being is existence. Non-being is somehow things being wiped out of existence. And because of that, the struggle for existence is really trying to assert my being when my existence feels threatened. I try to assert and say, no, I, I, I am, I am. I don't want to be not existing. Uh, and so there is non-being and there is a struggle to affirm our being, assert our being. Now, the struggle for physical existence in a civilized society, in the kind of times in which we live, He's mostly come to an end. It's probably increased a little bit because of terrorism and stuff like that, so people feel even physically threatened. But by and large, um, unless we get too paranoid about, about terroristic threat, we know that physically we are mostly okay. There are no longer... Jurassic Park is only in movies now. There aren't dinosaurs moving around. So physical threat is, is much, much less. Um, but there's another str struggle, not so much for physical existence, but the existence of the ego. Um, 
the ego existence can get threatened and that happens through through many different ways it can occur through through misunderstandings quarrels personality clashes and so on there are any number of ways when our ego feels threatened and the most common form of reaction when the ego is threatened is anxiety so anxiety is a is a symptom that my ego is feeling the threat of non being in some ways and then i then try to assert my being and that assertion can take different forms in different people now that anxiety which is the natural form of reaction to this ego being threatened uh has two 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 kinds of anxieties you could say or two forms one is the kind of a natural anxiety which every living being has the other be, other kind of anxiety is what we might call a pathological anxiety the pathological anxiety um is thankfully affects a, a relatively small number of living creatures pathological anxiety occurs often due to some very catastrophic events in life for which we are not prepared and those kind of events which don't make sense often then produce um kind of a repressed anger or shame or guilt in the mind and that produces a, a an anxiety which is not kind of a general kind of anxiety it's kind of a special kind of anxiety and that kind of a deeper almost clinical form of anxiety that belongs to a different field of psychology it's called abnormal psychology and in its extreme forms uh, it might even need a psychiatric treatment so that's this pathological anxiety but most of us i get 99 point i don't i don't have the numbers but but the majority of us um don't have pathological anxiety we have a general anxiety a common anxiety existential anxiety if you like the existential anxiety i mean simply the anxiety naturally associated with our existence as human beings or or living beings and that's a very natural thing it's a normal thing so if there is anxiety in our, in our heart we don't have to be worried about it it's not some kind of a sickness it's just the natural way this living being me is trying to deal with the threats around me now ideally this kind of anxiety that occurs naturally can be taken care of by every one of us by ourselves now all the 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 there are there are different kinds again these anxieties can be subdivided and and people who have done um some research on this or of try to study it deeply sometimes have tried to find different categories of anxieties and they generally um bring it down to shortlist it to three primary kinds of anxieties in life Let's say the anxiety of guilt and condemnation the anxiety of emptiness and meaninglessness and anxiety of fear and death now as i said um why i am speaking specifically about anxiety is that fears we are aware of that i am afraid of snakes or i am afraid of crocodiles or whatever whatever so fear is a little bit easier to take care of because if i know the object of fear i can somehow try to stay away from that object i may sometimes succeed i may not succeed but at least i know what to do anxiety because it doesn't have a clear object that is a little bit tougher th- not to crack if you like and so so these are the three kinds of anxieties uh, thinkers have often pointed to and they also say well these three kinds of anxieties can occur at any stage in life they have generally found that each of these kinds of anxiety is associated with a specific stage in life and they often say that the anxiety of guilt and condemnation occurs in early youth um so when we are young we are more prone to this anxiety 
related to guilt and condemnation. Somewhere in the midlife, um, there is the anxiety of emptiness and meaninglessness. Sometimes this gets characterized as a midlife crisis. That's when suddenly things look empty and meaning like, what does it all mean? It's, everything seems pointless. Um, and then, of course, towards the later stage of life, as we get older, then, the, then death and um, afterlife, which seemed like a distant reality when we were very young, no longer appear to be so distant. And then anxiety related to fate and death becomes more and more real. So as I said, while any of these anxieties can come anytime, they generally find that the preponderance of these anxieties in certain age groups. So besides categorizing all this, etc., the question that we as students of Vedanta can ask is, how will my understanding of myself and life, how will what I have learned from life itself, but also learned specifically from Vedantic teachings, how will it help me deal with, with these different kinds of anxiety whenever they show up in my own life? We have said time and again, and we'll continue saying it time and again, almost every week, that our true nature uh, is, is purity, freedom. That the Atman, that the body and the mind and the ego, these are merely coverings over my true identity as spirit. And the nature of the spirit is it's, it's unborn, it's, it's birthless, deathless, it's pure and free. Now, the question that always comes up is, of course, if that's my true nature, how why is it I don't experience it right now? From where did all this anxiety and fear, why should be there at all in the first place? And the answer is not complicated. The answer is, if I forget who I am, then, then uh, my being something doesn't help me. Let me give you an example. Let's say um, a very wealthy person, a millionaire or a billionaire, um, goes to sleep. Uh, and sleep, by definition, means I forget who I am. Because if I know who I am, then I'm not asleep. So by sleep means I've forgotten my true identity. And in the sleep, I start dreaming. Now, in the dream, this billionaire dreams that he or she is a uh, is a very homeless person, wandering about, uh, very hungry, no food anywhere, and no money to buy anything. Now, even when this dream is going on, this person is still the billionaire. This person can get whatever he or she wants. Unfortunately, at that time, this person doesn't know I'm a millionaire. So the pain and the suffering and the hardship that this billionaire experiences in the dream trying to find food is very real. At that time, if someone were to go and tell that person in the dream, why are you so worried? You are a billionaire. That person is either going to get angry or just feel that people are making fun of me. But actually, that's the reality. And so that's what I meant by saying, if I don't know who I am, then who I am cannot help me. And so if I'm the spirit and unborn and without death, immortal, free, none of that can help me right now if I don't know. If I'm asleep, if I'm asleep and if I'm dreaming, um, how, what kind of dream am I seeing? And Vedan says, well, this. Everything that I'm seeing, every morning I wake up and every night I sleep, all of that is a dream. So, in other words, every time I see myself and the world around me, as I forget that I'm this infinite being, that is a dream. And that is why, because of that forgetfulness of my infinite nature, 
I have made myself finite. I have forgotten that I, have, I am immortal. I have made myself mortal. I have forgotten that I am without birth. I now know that I was born a few years ago. I have forgotten that there is no death for me, and so I am concerned what, what will happen when I die. I have forgotten that I can never fall sick, and yet I am worried about illness. I try to eat organic food and take exercise, but still, a much simpler way is to know that there is no sickness for me. So that forgetfulness has caused all this. And so all of these anxieties are a direct result of that forgetfulness. For instance, the anxiety of guilt and condemnation is a negation of the essential purity of the self. If I know my true nature is pure, the spirit is pure, and that's who I am, then that anxiety shouldn't really come. But somehow, because of that forgetfulness, uh, that reality of my pure nature has gotten hidden. And that's why uh, the anxiety of guilt and condemnation has appeared in my life. Uh, the anxiety of emptiness and meaninglessness is a negation of the inherent perfection of the spirit, perfection of the Atman, that I'm perfect, I'm full, how can I be empty? How can things not make, not have meaning when there is perfection within me? I am perfect. So it's a negation of the perfection of the soul that produces the anxiety of meaninglessness. And finally, the anxiety related to death and fate is a negation of the very existence of the self. Because what is death? Just uh, last... Um, Thursday, uh, last week, I, I spoke at the Archbishop Williams School in, in Braintree. And one of the classes that I addressed to there, the theme was death and, and suffering. Um, and so one of the questions I posed these high school students was, okay, the reality of death, who is the one who is dying? Who dies? Because even if we believe in some kind of a heaven we go to, then I'm not dead. So, because I'm there, I, I am still going with the Lord, to the Lord and staying wherever. But, but then what, is the, what does death really mean? And finally, we, we just have to say, well, death as it appears to us means that this body now, which is moving and doing everything, is now going to be non-functional it's not going to be able to do what it does. All the consciousness from the body will simply disappear. It will just lie motionless. Not just asleep, it's not even breathing. That's essentially what death is. That doesn't necessarily mean the end of me. And one of the anxieties related to death is because we associate death with, with non-existence. In fact, oftentimes we tend to treat life and death as opposites. But life is not the opposite of death. The opposite of death is birth. So we can say birth and death. And so one way of understanding that is life really has no opposite this thing. Although sometimes we, we just say life and death. Because death is not really a death. If we say, well, who is dying? And if we just the body that is going, does anything survive the destruction of the body? Oftentimes, the characteristics of the Atman get encapsulated by this term Sat Chit Ananda. These are not exactly qualities of the Atman, because philosophically, Atman has, is beyond qualities. Philosophically also, you cannot say exactly what it is, because language is too limited an instrument to be able to express the inexpressible. So even when we say that that highest reality is, is absolute being, absolute consciousness, and absolute bliss, what we are really saying is that we are negating the opposite of it. In other words, when we say that sat means it is not a sat, that it is, you are not saying it's being, you are just saying it is not non-being. 
When we say it is consciousness or chit, what we are really saying is it is not insentient, it's not material. It's not just some kind of, because sometimes people think about it as some kind of a force or an energy. No, it's, it's, it's living, it's, it's life, life, alive. And bliss means, again, it means that there is no suffering there. So it's just, we can say what it is not, we cannot say what it is. So the guilt of, the anxiety of guilt and condemnation is a negation of the ananda aspect of, of, of our true nature. The anxiety of emptiness and meaninglessness is a negation of the chit aspect, the consciousness. And the anxiety related to fate and death is a negation of the sat being itself because we feel the being itself is threatened. So how do we then? If, if this is how the threat occurs, and this is how the forgetfulness of our true nature occurs, how do we deal with it? And there are at least four different ways we can deal with it. And these are four different sources of courage or strength. Because if the only way fear can be countered is through strength, through, through, through courage. So what are the sources of courage? From where can I get strength in life? And the first source of strength in life is, is a strong ethical life. We can call this a moral courage or moral strength. If someone can live with some genuine values and principles in life, that let's say I'm going to lead an honest life, a truthful life. I'm not going to hurt anyone. I'm going to be as helpful as I can to others. So whatever way we understand ethics and morality, people who lead a moral life are very strong people. And that strength need not always show itself in, like, in your, your biceps. I mean, there's one kind of strength we get when you go to a gym, uh, visit gym and do uh, exercises. But this is inner strength. Uh, and that manifests in a way, uh, one way of seeing how much inner strength we have is by how I'm able to deal with the inevitable ups and downs in my life. The, and that ups and downs occur in the lives of everyone. It can occur at the physical level in matters of health. It can occur in, in, in matters of career. It can happen in terms of uh, interpersonal relationships. In, in many different levels, um, life is never a straight line. It, there's always ups and downs. In fact, uh, when, we, when they hook up people with their for heart, this thing, etc., if we just a straight line with the person is dead. So as long as there are these waves, it's, we at least know that the person is living. And so ups and downs are inevitable. Um, but our inner strength shows itself in how mature a way I can deal with the ups and downs. Sometimes they speak about riding a wave. So when you're deep inside the ocean and these huge waves coming, you can't fight the waves. The waves are going to be there. Can I find a way by which I'll be able to ride those waves rather than getting submerged under them? So life will send all these huge waves, tsunamis sometimes, but can I be skillful enough to, to not fight what, what it's really too strong for us, but find a way by which I can survive, by which I can hold my peace, by which I can find some, some pillar of stability in my life. And, and moral life gives us that pillar. One doesn't even have to believe in God. One doesn't have to be religious. A person can be a... It's very difficult to find a, a, a really genuine atheist. A lot of people might claim to be atheists, but, but, but it's very... It's Swami Vivekananda once said, he said, I'm going to crawl... I'm willing to crawl 20 miles on my hand to find a real atheist. Uh, oftentimes, when we, when we are disillusioned with a kind of religion that we are exposed to. People say, oh, I don't believe in all this. So it's easy to say I don't believe in it. 
but but um, it's it's not easy to be an atheist. But even if one is a genuine atheist, but if that person holds on to a strong moral and ethical life, and it's possible to do so, just because someone is not religious doesn't automatically mean the person is immoral. Morality and spirituality are connected, but they are they are distinct. And so it's possible to be moral without necessarily being religious. But a moral life can give give enormous strength to a person. And what moral life does, this ego, which is felt threatened, ego takes refuge in the power of good life, moral life, in the life of dharma. Dharma itself, there is a saying in the Mahabharata, which says, dharmo rakshati rakshitaha. If you protect dharma, dharma protects you. So if I hold on to ethical life, if I hold on to the power of moral life, that moral life itself will protect me. And so, if my ego, when it feels overwhelmed by threats coming from all sides, takes refuge in the power of dharma, it will be able to deal with this threat and acquire courage. And that is, what, that is one way uh, we can deal with this anxieties and fear, to taking refuge in dharma. And karma yoga is, among the yogas, karma yoga is probably the best way. Um, one doesn't necessarily have to be too religious to practice karma yoga. But karma yoga gives us that foundation to take refuge in dharma, a good, honest, ethical life to deal with the inevitable ups and downs in our lives. The second way we can get courage and strength in life is through what we might say a religious courage. Someone who truly believes in God. Again, it's very easy to say, oh, I'm a believer. It's very easy to say I have faith in God. But, but to have faith in God, Sri Ramakrishna used to say, if you have faith, half the battle is won. So it's not that we don't have faith, but our faith is oftentimes a bit shaky. So if there are, if something doesn't go according to the way we want it to go, my faith starts, faith starts, what do you call this? It, it's, it doesn't have a very strong foundation. It, my, it, my faith itself feels threatened. There are people who have stopped going to a temple or a church or stopped praying. They said, oh, what's the point? I prayed and nothing happened. So I'm not going to do it. So it's a very fragile faith. But if the faith is strong, it can give enormous courage. Throughout history, in every part of this planet, we have seen people from different traditions with that strong faith in God have done amazing things. They were not afraid of the challenges, afraid of the hardships. Out of love for God, they could do so much. Out of love for God, they could face all challenges and hardships in a calm way. So that courage, that strength came from recognizing that God is there to protect me. God is always there to protect me. When we forget that God is there, uh, fear comes. And that's one way, as devotees, if I truly believe that God is all-pervading, not just when we are talking philosophy, and not talking about theology, that, no, in my daily life, if I truly believe that God is all-pervading, God is everywhere, then, then uh, there's no reason why I should feel afraid of anything. Uh, just like a baby is never afraid when it is in her mother's, um, mother's uh, embrace or when it's with her mother, um, we are always with God the Father or God the Mother. There is no reason. Swami Ramakrishnananda, a great disciple of Ramakrishna, used to say that the presence of, of fear and anxiety in a mind is a sign that my faith has not become strong yet. Because a, a complete, a strong faith would eliminate all fear and anxiety. So when my ego takes shelter in God, takes refuge at the feet of God, then this religious courage fills my heart. And then I'm able to deal with any and every kind of anxiety. So in the first case, the ego takes refuge in dharma. 
In the second case, the ego takes refuge in God. In whichever way um, we understand the divine being, there is not just one standard way to do it. We have complete freedom to say, how do I think of the divine? And if I truly believe that the divine is here to protect me, to guide me, then all fear and anxiety will leave me. A third source of, of courage is what sometimes gets called the courage to be. When the ego asserts itself, its own real being, and that is called, we could call it the, um, the kind of courage that Jnana Yoga speaks about. So the first one I said was Karma Yoga. Taking refuge in God is, is emphasized in Bhakti Yoga. And in Jnana Yoga, it's affirming one's own reality, that I am the Atman, never forgetting that I am this birthless, deathless, pure, free being, affirming my identity as the spirit. I take refuge in my own being. I assert my being. When that happens, all these fears associated with it go away. So these are three ways we can deal with, with anxiety and fear through karma yoga, bhakti yoga, jnana yoga. By my ego taking refuge in, in moral life or in dharma, my ego taking refuge in God, or my ego taking refuge in its own true being, affirming its own being. Now there is a fourth way, which is at least partly helpful, and that is the ego taking refuge in a larger group. Um, it's not a foolproof solution, but, but it does work. For instance now, um, because let's say now the threat of terrorism, what as individual beings, what can we do to protect ourselves? But once you know, oh, if I'm flying, then there is the TSA, they are at least scanning people and I'm a part of this, I, I get this privilege of my security being taken care of by a larger group of which I'm a part, then I feel more secure. So threats, external threats, can be met at least partially if I voluntarily choose to be a part of a larger group. So if affirming my being is the courage to be, then being part of a group is the courage to be a part of a larger whole. Because when I'm part of a larger whole, I gain something, I lose something. Um, well, it's like this. For instance now, if I'm as a citizen of a country, well, I'm a part of a larger whole. And so the country as a whole then provides me with security, with, with, with protection, and some of the other privileges that all citizens have. Now that's what a person gains. What we lose is some amount of freedom. I can't do whatever I want. I have to abide by the constitution of the country of which I'm a citizen. I have to abide by the laws. I might want to drive at 100 miles per hour. And they say, no, 65. And I say, where is my freedom? No, you have chosen to be a part of this group. So you have to. So, so that's the downside of it, that when I choose to be a part of a larger whole, I gain something, I gain protection from the things that I are potentially threatening to me. So some of my fears and anxieties are taken care of by being part of a larger whole, but, but I, I also lose a little bit of myself in just being part. So these are four general ways of which the the, the, the downside of that fourth one, being part of a larger group, is what group am I a part of? Because not all groups, not all larger wholes are, are necessarily wholesome. In fact, some of these big movements that have come, whether it's communism, Nazism, even um, fundamentalism, fundamentalist groups, the people, when they become parts of these larger movements, they are, as individuals, they have found that their ego taking refuge in these larger movements is, is 
removing some of their fears and anxieties. So some of their problems are being solved. But we know, depending on what kind of a group a person is a part of, a larger problems can occur. And so that's, that, that is a, that's a little a warning, warning uh, signal there. Uh, because all, all groups can, can have, uh, we, we need to be very careful that to which group have I aligned myself to. That while it may help solve some of my personal problems, but the group itself is creating a larger problem in society. And so that's, that's one thing, because that's the only way, the fourth part, that being a part of a group, is really involved something other than myself. As for the first three, whether it's moral strength, religious strength, a strength that comes from affirming my, my true nature, those are completely individual. And that is up to us of how we want to employ that in our lives. So then, just to summarize, when we are confronted with, with different forms of non-being, how, how do we react to it? Um, one way is when I feel that general anxiety of related to guilt and condemnation in my life, a person can say, in a theistic way, a person can say, God loves me and God has forgiven me. That would help deal with this anxiety of guilt. God's love for me and God's forgiveness. Um, in a, in a, in a um, jnana yoga approach to that would be to affirm that I am pure and blissful and no sin can touch me by true nature. So affirming either from the knowledge perspective or from the devotional perspective, we can deal with the guilt uh, and condemnation in our life. The guilt of the anxiety of emptiness and meaningless, meaninglessness in life um, a devotee can say, God fills my heart with his love and I don't feel empty. Why, do I, why should I feel empty? If my heart is filled with love for God, there is no reason why anything should appear empty. If I see the play of the divine everywhere around me, if I see everyone as children of God, if I see everywhere, they say that if you see a tree and then say it's a tree, you are not seeing anything. But if you see a tree and see there a miracle of God, then you have seen something. So when my heart is filled with love for God, I will see everything just brimming with divine presence. We see, and it's not some, some theoretic, theoretical formulation. We see that in the lives of great mystics, great saints. When you read Ramakrishna's life, you see, just filled with the bliss of the divine. No matter where he saw, even in things that didn't appear particularly religious, he just saw it's the Divine Mother's play in some different form, in some different way. So God fills my heart with his love and God forgives me. Um, in a path of knowledge, one can say, I'm full of consciousness and every experience is meaningful to me. That every discovering meaning in every existence even if one doesn't bring a theistic idea of God in it, it's still possible to deal with the anxiety of meaninglessness and, and emptiness. And finally, the anxiety related to fate and death. A devotee can say, God is eternal, and being in his presence, I live through eternity. If I'm with God, and God lives eternally, then my eternal existence is guaranteed. That's how a devotee looks at it. As far as the, the path of knowledge, one can say, I'm immortal, and death is only an event in my unbroken life. Existence, I'm one with existence. It's not that I exist, I'm existence itself. So, as a body and mind, there is such a thing as non-existence, there is such a thing as impermanence. But existence itself cannot become non-existent. In fact, the Upanishad says, um, which defines that the divine is existence. Sadeva Somya idam agra asit, in the Upanishad, existence alone remained. And then 
the Upanishad goes on to point out that if someone says God doesn't exist or Brahman doesn't exist, I'm not sure if Brahman exists, it is like saying I'm not sure whether I exist. And the Upanishad says, we can question the existence of anything apart from ourselves. We simply cannot question our own existence. Okay, just logically, it's not possible. Because if I say, I'm not sure whether I exist or not, the first question is, who is not sure? Is the person who is not sure existing? Who is the one who is asking that question? Who is the one who is having that doubt? So our own existence is never, is beyond question because um, it just logically doesn't make sense. So anyway, so there are these different ways by which anxiety and fear in our life can be, can be dealt with. Um, all of this might seem a bit too technical, but apart from all these concepts and ideas, if we just take a look at just at our own life and see that what are the kind of different anxieties I have, What are the different fears I have? And what am I doing? Am I doing anything at all to deal meaningfully with these fears and anxieties? Because they will not, I can guarantee you this, they will not go away on their own. Sometimes we think, oh, just kind of wait, and after a while it will go away. No, they don't. They just kind of go back and just remain submerged inside the unconscious part of the mind. And then again, they pop up every now and then. And we don't want our life to be a constant struggle, all the time somehow hoping that the bad times will go away and then kind of relishing the good time and always afraid, oh my God, this will, because everything is impermanent, these good times will go away. At some point, we just have to find a way of not constantly being in battle with all the challenges that come and holding on to these Some of these principles we took a look at very briefly today might help us deal with the fears and anxieties in our life in a a more meaningful way. Om Jananim Saratam Devim Ramakrishnam Jagat Gurum Padapadme Tayo Shritva Pranamami Muhur Muhur